ship, right? And then uh, answer any questions that you might have. So just to, uh, to again, to get right into it, to give you a little bit of background on myself, um, I was born and raised here in Lafayette, and uh, I actually went to Ball State because I wasn't good enough to play football at Purdue. So I uh, went over to Ball State, and I studied criminal justice and corrections. And um, I was a Houston police officer for about 18 months and then came back to the city of Lafayette and uh, we're a retired police captain uh, with the city of Lafayette and also during that time I did uh, four years in the Lafayette City Council and now for the past uh, 14 years I've been the mayor of the city of Lafayette so I joke around I've been going to the same building to work uh, for 35 years I just go in different doors um, so that's just a real quick and I know we don't have a lot of time it's just a real quick background uh, on myself. You know, I was lucky. I, I'd also like to, I know some of you are, um, as you picked your careers, I was lucky. I knew from about eighth grade on that I wanted to be a police officer. Nobody in my family had been involved in law enforcement or any way, but I knew that I wanted to be, be a police officer. And so I felt very fortunate that I kind of knew at such an early age and helped me do some developmental things along the way. And of course, in, in college then for my career. But during that, in that capacity, I have had the opportunity to be in several different uh, leadership roles and then in leadership roles in the, in the public sector. So we'll just start with some of those things and some of the things that I've learned. Um, you know, during my police career, I started off in the patrol division, then I became a detective. I later was promoted to sergeant, and I later was promoted to lieutenant, and then I was promoted to captain, uh, where I retired at the rank of captain. During that period of time, um, I did a lot of different duties. I was in charge of the SWAT team. I was in charge of the Civil Disturbance Unit. I was in charge of our field training program. I was in charge of the patrol division, the traffic division, uh, and I had different roles in the hiring process throughout my career. And each one of those taught me some different lessons about leadership and about what it takes to um, motivate people to complete tasks, to complete assignments, uh, and not just things that you need done, you know, it's different, right? Different types of leadership, not just things that you need done in a five-minute window, but things that you need done in a 20-minute window, two days, five years, or 10 years down the road that you want to continually be able to move and motivate an organization. And there are some, I think, some real uh, key pieces to leadership that are pretty uh, universal, at least it has been for mine. Now, this may not agree with everything you read in a textbook, I'm just going to tell you what my experience has taught me. So first and foremost, I think one of the greatest things that will help you be a good leader is, first of all, do something that you have a passion about. If you're involved in, in an organization, what your profession is, uh, what the cause is, if it's something that you have a passion about, for me, that makes it much easier to lead because you really believe in what you're doing. And the quality of a good leader is, you really must believe in what you're doing because if you don't believe in what you're doing, it's very hard to motivate others to achieve those goals. And believe me, people will pick out very quickly if you don't really believe in your mission, your assignment, the change that you're trying to make within your organization, the product you're trying to sell, the project you're trying to design. If you don't believe in what you're doing, in my opinion, it's very hard to become a good leader. And you also have to be sincere. People pick out very quickly if you're not really sincere about what you're doing and you're not sincere about their welfare as well. How many of you have ever read, and there's started out there was just a few books, now there's a plethora of books. How many of you ever read a book on servant leadership? Okay, we're in trouble. No, I'm teasing. So, um, there's a, several books out there, and I would encourage you to look at some of those books on servant leadership. I think um, you will find, and for me, that's the way I define my leadership style is, I am here to serve others. I am here to serve those that work for me, those work with me, and those in the greater community that I serve. And if you adopt that policy of servant leadership, people will pick up very quickly that you actually care that you're actually committed, that you're in this for the long haul, that you care about their success, their ideas, and their opportunities to also be successful. So I would really encourage you, 
If you haven't read any books yet, get a book or two on servant leadership. Look at that concept. Look at what it means and how people have put that into some really phenomenal, phenomenal practices uh, across the world. I think also, you know, I was, I guess I should back up just a little bit. I don't consider myself a person who was just born a natural leader. I mean, if you saw me growing up, if you saw me in different situations, I was just a pretty normal kid. Um, I was in scouts, I played some sports, I did some things like that, but you wouldn't have looked at me and just said, oh wow, there, that, there's a natural leader, that's somebody that's going to go places, or that's somebody that can really command a room. Um, for me, leadership was actually a growth process. It happened over time, but it did happen deliberately. Once I became, got on the police department, I knew that I wanted to obtain some leadership roles within the police department, and I wanted to try to get promoted. So I actually read a lot of books on leadership. Some were valuable, some weren't. But I would encourage you to also, there's been some really phenomenal people, and I don't just mean generals that have led, led us into war or CEOs that have built great companies. There's been a lot of tremendous leaders in social issues and world causes that have, that have literally changed the course of history. And you don't have to re recreate the wheel on everything. There are some really valuable lessons as you look at some of those phenomenal people and what they've been able to do throughout history. So I would encourage you to read. Now, I've, uh, like I said, I ran for city council and uh, I won that and I've won four uh, elections now as mayor. So I've won five elections. I can tell you uh, when I first started, I knew nothing about running for office. I knew nothing about how to put a campaign together. But I literally went to the Tippecanoe County Public Library and got books and taught myself how to do that. And there are things, and I, I equate that back to leadership. There are some great, and I actually brought a, just a couple here, real simple books that I'm going to show you just a little bit um, later on how, how things can make a tremendous uh, difference. Um, the other thing that I believe in, and again, some of the books that you read probably will not say the same thing, but I think it's important for me as a leader, particularly in my position as mayor, and not all leadership positions are the same, it's important for me and for others to know that I have a basic understanding of the entire organization, right? I understand, well, I understand the police side a lot. I understand the fire side. I know the principles behind cleaning water so you can drink it safely. I know the principles behind how we clean our water after it gets to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, I probably know more about pipes and engineering than I ever thought I would uh, as a mayor. I know a lot about parks and recreation. I know a lot about technology now. I know a lot about purchasing. For me, I think it's important as I lead my organization that they know that I have made the effort to have a good working knowledge of everything that we do and that when we're discussing projects, we're discussing processes, we're discussing changes that need to be made within an organization, the people that work with me as team members know that I have that, that knowledge and I think that creates a better leadership at atmosphere for me and it allows me then when I do have to give orders, or I do have to put out a directive, people understand, well, he really does know what's going on. You know, it, it's, uh, if somebody walks into you that you're supposed to be leading and they talk about a project or they talk about a process and you have to say, well, I don't know anything about that, or really, you know, I don't really mess with stuff that low on the totem pole or something, you lose a lot of credibility. I mean, at least in my opinion, you lose a lot of credibility. I work, uh, leadership is a lot of work. If you're gonna be a good leader, it's a lot of work. I work 12 to 14 hours a day, it's my job seven days a week. When I get all my work done in the evening, all my meetings, everything I have to get done, I spend a considerable amount of time doing just what I told you, reviewing projects, reviewing processes, looking up things I wanna make sure I understand for my next meeting so I can adequately discuss it with my chief of the wastewater utility, which 
People think, well, wastewater, big deal. You know how much our wastewater utility is? It's a $300 million facility. A $300 million facility. Okay, without it, we wouldn't have most of the things that we have in the community. It's not glamorous, but you have to have it. So I spend a lot of time studying. A good leader studies. A good leader reads. I mean, you've got to have the dreamers, right? And I've got them on my staff, the big picture people that uh, come up with the great concepts and ideas. And then you've got to hone it down, and then you've got to figure out how to pay for it, too. So you need the financial guys. A good leader, in my opinion, is a little bit of both. You understand the technical part, you can have that big vision, you can help promote that vision, but you have to be able to walk the walk to have the credibility with the people that you uh, lead. I spend so many hours a week out in the field. I do not sit behind my desk all week. So many hours a week I am out checking road projects, I'm at the water plant, I'm at this wastewater plant, I run by a fire station, I'm in the engineer's office, I am physically out checking so they know that I'm doing things in the field and I'm not just sitting behind my desk looking at papers and giving orders. And I think that's important that a good leader spends so much time out in the field actually looking at projects, interacting with your staff, right? I don't just interact with my department heads. I have, four, you know, Lafayette's not a small city anymore. We're about 70 Oh, about 72,000 people, which is not huge in the scope of the world, but in Indiana, puts us about number 10 for the 10th largest uh, city. In Indiana, if you put all our budgets together, we're about $120 million a year to keep the city running, have about 600 full-time employees. So we're not a small organization, we're a large organization. So I get out, and I don't just talk to the department heads. I talk to the department heads, but I talk to the mid-level management. And then I talk to the guy on the street, whether it's the guy picking up the trash, throwing the leaves and limbs, the operators down at the wastewater plant, or anybody. I get out and actually talk to the people doing the work. How are they doing? What do they see? What improvements could we be make on their level, looking at from what they see each and every day, and trying to gather that input? Because one of the most important things that you have to be able to realize to be a good leader is you don't have all the good ideas. And if you ever get yourself in a mindset where, you know, I don't really need to listen to my staff, I don't really need to listen to anybody else, I've got the vision, I've got all the right ideas, then you're going to start to fail because none of us are that smart. We all need good people around us. The best thing I do is hire the best people possible and let them work. Sometimes I know just to stay out of their way. And that's not easy for the city of Lafayette because it's very difficult for me to compete with the private sector to hire people. I can't pay the same salaries. So we have to create a work environment where people want to work for us and many times take a significant cut in pay to come to work for the city of Lafayette or when I finally do lose somebody, um, like I just lost my city engineer uh, not too long ago, it, I kept her a long time. I've had the private sector trying to steal her for years, and I can tell you she got about a 40% pay increase, and that's what it took to finally get her to leave our environment. And my current city engineer, who thank goodness was from Lafayette and wanted to stay here, took a significant pay decrease to come to work for the city of Lafayette, but he wants to make a difference in the community where he's from. And so we have to work really hard on how we lead and how we manage our organization because that environment's what helps us keep people here, and that's important. I've always made it clear, you know, it's, it's kind of an overused phrase, oh, I've got an open door. Well, nobody's got a total open door, right? We all have meetings, we all have things going on, people just can't walk in and out anytime they want. But you do have to keep that door always cracked, all right? People have to always know that they can get in to see you and they can share their ideas and you're going to listen and you value their input and that you take it to heart. Because I'll tell you what, I personally, I could care less if the idea is mine. If it's a good idea, it's going to move the city of Lafayette forward. It's good for our citizens and our taxpayers. I don't care if it's mine, somebody on my staff or somebody off the street that just walks in and says, hey, Mayor, I just thought of something. 
What do you think about this? I'll sit down and listen, because that's where great ideas come from. They come from that collaborative approach of bringing people together, people feeling very uh, comfortable being open and sharing their thoughts and ideas with you. Know that there's not going to be any reprimands. There's not going to be, well, that's, that's a silly idea. Where uh, each idea is valued. Now, you don't implement each idea, and not all, each idea has the same level of value, but through that collaborative approach, you get the best ideas possible. I can tell you people that work for me feel very comfortable when I tell them, hey, I got a great idea, I'm gonna do this. And then I, I look and I see and they're kind of smiling and they, I know what's coming. Well, Mayor, have you thought about this, you know? Have you thought about this? Mm, no, I guess I really didn't. Pretty soon, it's not so much, it's only about this much of my idea anymore, but now the new idea and the new way of doing it is fantastic. And they, they, they're comfortable with that. And they know I don't care if they fail, right? We are, we are an entrepreneurial type enterprise, and that's the way we look at it. We look at it as we're innovators, we're entrepreneurial in nature. So if they've got an idea, and we want to try to do something different, because governments like anything else, we should be in a state of continual change, a state of continually reinventing ourselves to make us more effective, more efficient, to make us leaner, to provide better services, to look to the future, to strategic plan in a new and different way. We should do the same things as everybody else so we're not getting stale. So people that work for me know it's okay to fail. If we try something and we try 10 things and eight of them work out great, we implement those eight, we're gonna implement them. And if two don't work out so well, we shove them off to the side and we keep going. But we're not afraid to try new things and new ideas. When I first took over, I'll be honest with you, 14 years ago, there was a lot of silos in the city of Lafayette. This department did this, this department did this, this department did this. There was very, very little cross-training, cross-collaboration, um, and it took me a few years, but we broke those silos down. Everybody works as that, that team concept where we all share resources, we share manpower, we share equipment, um, and that helps us get a lot more done than we were able to get done before and at a much more cost-effective price uh, for our taxpayers. And that's what you've got to be able to do. You've got to, as a leader, you've got to make sure you don't have a siloed organization, that you have people crossing. You've got to promote lifelong learning. You want people to be lifelong learning. You have to promote self-improvement. You want people to feel like they're continually growing, that they have a voice, that there's new opportunity within that organization, and that you really care. And you care about them, and you care about their families, and you want to know what's going on in their lives, and you take those time to have those personal moments too. Now, I don't go out and socialize, really, with the people that work for me, few of them that I grew up with, but I do take the time to make sure that they care if their child's sick, if somebody's in the hospital, or if their kid scored the winning goal at the soccer game the other night. It's important to know that I care about them, and I really do on a personal and professional level. And I do my best to learn as many names as their family members and everybody that I possibly can, because I want us to feel like we're a family and like we're a large organization that still has that small feel about it. So, you know, as you, as you think about how do I lead, you have to really understand the organization and your organizational goals. I mean, it's a little bit different the way I would lead the SWAT team when we're running a SWAT operation trying to catch someone who just shot somebody as opposed to the way I might lead a group of park personnel that are looking at designing the next playground, right? So a leader has to be adaptable. You have to be able to think on your feet, you have to be able to make decisions, and you have to understand the task that you're, that you're trying to accomplish, the change that you're trying to make happen. And you, like I said, we want change to be continual, not episodic. It needs to be continual if we're gonna be nimble on our feet. So again, what's that require of you? That requires work, right? You can't just say, okay, at two o'clock, I've got a uh, meeting over this topic and at 1.59, you haven't done any preparation for your meeting. That's not leadership. That's lazy. Okay? You get prepared for those meetings at some level so, you can, so they're high quality and the people that prepared a lot 
to come see you know that you've put the effort back into what they're trying to do. And if you do that, you build relationships and you build loyalty. I mean, I feel very blessed. I mean, I did just lose a city engineer, but I lose very, very few people at the city of Lafayette. I don't have, heart, I don't have a lot of turnover. And like I said, we cannot compete in the private sector for pay. But you build that sense of loyalty and that sense of accomplishment. People, and then people feel like they have, they're empowered to really achieve what they want to achieve within their departments. And that's the overall environment that you want to try to, try to keep. But it's work. I mean, if you think you just walk in a room and all of a sudden you're a leader or because you, you get promoted to a certain level uh, within an organization and the light bulb goes on and you've got it all figured out, that doesn't happen very often. And uh, you have to learn to find balance too, as I said. Within our organization, I have the dreamers, right? The people that see that big picture and they want to do everything. And then over here, I've got the controller and a few more people that are like, whoa, 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 how are you going to pay for that? Maybe we should do this in segments. Maybe we should do this over a multi-year period. And they collide and they clash, right? And it's my job to kind of referee that and not take away the excitement of the dreamer, but make sure we're living within the reality of living within our means. And, but let that happen. Let that energy happen. You want your organization to feel energized. You don't want people to walk into work every day. Whew, I'm here again, all right? You want them to walk into work. Hey, how are we doing? Good, good. What do you got? got a lot going on today. Day will be over with before we know it. It'll go so fast. And everybody comes in kind of with that energy and enthusiasm, and there's that sense of purpose that you have within the organization. One thing that um, I like to, that I think is really really important. You, you run different types of meetings, right? So you'll have meetings where you may have just three or four of us at a meeting, more, more interpersonal, and you may conduct yourself and run that meeting in a way to get the information and the desired results you need in one way. And then you'll have times to be leaders where, you know, you may have to talk to two or three hundred people. Well, whether it's being able to speak in public or be able to speak in those smaller meetings or medium-sized groups, that is an incredibly important piece, particularly dependent if you're in a job like I am, is being able to speak in public and to be able to convey your message in a way that resonates with people and they understand it. So I've got a few things here. These are really simple. And I know, I mean, I've, I've got four kids uh, and I've got a daughter that works at Purdue. My two youngest kids are still at Purdue. Um, so I've tried this with them, and I know it's hard to convince people. So I'm going to plant the seed that someday you may pick this up as you're thinking about leadership or depending on what you have to do. This book was given to me years ago, and it's called Speak Like Churchill, Stand Like Lincoln. And it is, for me, the single most effective book I've ever read on public speaking. And there are, what, 10 million or more? And some of them are this thick. This book, you can read this book, well, if you don't spend too much time at Harry's, you can, you can, read, you can read this book in less than a week or a weekend, right? So, like I said, I still got two girls here at Purdue. So, um, if you ever want to pick it up, if, you're, if you know you got to give a lot of presentations, if you're going into a field, I mean, it's, it's really phenomenal. It tells you how to do power starts, the power pause, the power opener, uh, and then it uses all kinds of examples through history. And so it's, it's incredibly important. See, all right? Power pause, right? You stop, right? Now that was kind of phony because I'm doing it, right? But I'm telling you, the stuff in this works. You never start a speech this is really good. You never start a speech why? Well, thank you for having me today. I'm real honored to be here at the Epics class. You know, you start, you start a speech typically when you've got a group and a certain topic with some kind of big story, right, to get their attention right off the bat. So one day I was helping a group of kids that were on a speech team, and I was trying to teach them the importance of starting with something that gets your audience's attention, right? Ronald Reagan 
was a great at telling stories. Winston Churchill, I mean, lots of people that were really good at telling stories. So I walked in, and it was about spring break time, and uh, they were getting ready for a big competition. I said, hey, before we get started, I want to talk to you a little bit about an opportunity that I have. I said, hey, there's a company in town. They're looking at hiring some students to help market this product, and they need people that can speak. And if you do a really good job in like a month, they'll pay you like $1,000. I know it's getting close to spring breaks, and we have some other expenses, and we went on and on. And I mean, every kid started scooting their chair closer to me, right? Well, so then I stopped. I said, look, there's not really a job. And they're like, oh, that's real funny, Mayor. But we use that as an example of how that got their attention, how you brought the audience in right away, delivered your message, and then later on. So this, this book here, I'm telling you, easy read. When I prepare a speech to this day, if I get stuck, and I talk from everything to groups this size, to hundreds of people at a time, I testify down in Indianapolis, uh, at the House of Representatives, I go to Washington, D.C. To this day, I still use this book. The other one that's really good, it's called Lincoln on Leadership. I'm not promoting any one political party. Actually, Lincoln was a Republican. I'm a Democrat. But uh, um, Lincoln on Leadership, again, it is a phenomenal book on how to prepare a speech and how to write and communicate. And Lincoln was a storyteller, right? He did a lot of storytelling. But there is a lot of things in here that you can still use till today. So uh, those are just a couple books. And then for me, again, I'm not promoting any religion or li religion at all. But I have a book called Leadership Prayers. And if it's something that, that, that that's part of what you do, uh, it is for me. My faith is important to me. This was actually given to me by the city engineer that just left. She gave it to me on my birthday in 2009. It says, Tony. Now, people just call me Tony. They don't have to call me Mayor, Mr. Mayor. My staff could call me Tony. It says, Tony, thank you for your wonderful example. I enjoy being part of this great team. Happy birthday and best wishes, Jenny Miller. And I thought it was really neat that she gave me a book on leadership prayers. And if you read this, there's about 20 examples of everything from how to put together a succession plan, how to get through weariness, how to market, um, wisdom, ownership, and then there are stories that go along with it where somebody in a really, really tough spot had to make a really, really hard decision and how they use some of the, the, the principles in here to make those decisions. And I think that's, again, that's a good book because for me, Time helps develop leaders. There are no, there's no doubt about it. And experience, because you're going to make a mistake. I'd love to be able to stand here and tell you, but it's on camera, so I really can't, that uh, I've never made a mistake, that every leadership decision I ever made worked out just the way I wanted it to. But that's, that was not the truth. People, all of us, we weigh a situation. We try to figure it out the best we can. We make a decision. And then you know what? we got to own it. And if it's wrong, you got to be big enough to say, you know what, that's wrong. That didn't work out the way that I hoped to do it. Here's why we made our decision based on this. And that's why the collaborative approach helps you avoid those as much as possible. Not all the time, but helps you avoid it. But then once you make that decision, you've got to own it. Right or wrong, you've got to own it. Because if you don't, you'll never lead. You know, at the City of Lafayette, everybody knows when things go well, I try to do everything to, sh to share those successes. I let other people be on TV, talk to the media, do stuff. And when things go bad, I do the media, right? I do the bad part. That's how you lead. You let other people share in the good stuff. You take the bad part. And if you do that, people will follow you. And people will work very hard for you. And they will see that sincerity and they will see that commitment that you have to them and the organization and to care about uh, their well-beings. But like I said, it is, it's a lot of work. Leadership just doesn't happen. Um, you know, people always talk about, too, about being decisive. You've got to be decisive. You've got to be decisive. Well, sometimes you do have to be decisive. And sometimes, especially under police operations, you've got to be decisive and live with it. 
And even in our organization, sometimes it comes down to, well, 